Good afternoon. My name is Tom Beaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series that are held here at the Museum of Nebraska History every third Thursday of the month. A detailed schedule of this series can be found on our website uh, about our programs at uh, www.nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska Historical Society Foundation for the funding of the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Our speaker today is John Carter, who has been with the Society since 1976. John is a native of Nebraska, but has roots in north central Nebraska, Bassett in that area. Uh, John will be talking, uh, his program today will be about tourist traps and attractions along Nebraska's highways. Uh, now, personally, this brought the note to me when we would travel back and forth on Highway 30 and there was the Rattlesnake Ranch west of Brule, Nebraska. And when I was a kid, what impressed me the most was the sign on the highway that said, see rattlesnake strike one quarter mile. <laughs> they were big. John. <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you, Tom. Um, I want to start with a simple declaration. Uh, this is in no way going to be a scholarly presentation. There is no way that I can be objective or dispassionate about this particular subject because I'm talking about places that I absolutely love. <laughs> So even though I use the word tourist traps, and that has a specific meaning that we'll get to, um, <clears throat> I'm talking about magical places. Uh, places that in our youth we uh, uh, were drawn to with our parents. There are the breaks and the long, tedious miles along the highway on our way to Yellowstone or uh, uh, Black Hills or uh, Colorado, uh, and they punctuate that trip with really memorable experiences. And I think it's those memorable experiences that, that make these places special. So, um, and it's an appropriate time to be talking about uh, tourist trips and tourist traps and family uh, vacations. We're in the dog days of summer, so-called because the Dog Star Sirius rises at the same time the sun does and allegedly uh, causes the sun to burn hotter. Uh, I'm confident that there are many people uh, in this room right now, given that this is the year 2012 and the longest drought uh, allegedly in the history of the Great Plains, uh, who know exactly what dog days mean. Uh, for many a school kid, dog days are uh, the escape. They're the swimming pool, uh, if you're unlucky, summer school, uh, but the family vacation. And that's a social phenomena that uh, I'm, I'm smitten with. One of the things that I'd, I'd like to point out is that we're talking about now uh, not only a... Uh, uh, a culture, but a specific architecture. And that's the architecture that grows up along a strange settlement pattern that we call highways. Uh, these aren't like dots on a map where you see people congregating in serious numbers that we call towns, villages, cities, whatever. Uh, these, are, these are expanses. And that uh, uh, those expanses are filled uh, with all sorts of things catering to the needs and interests of uh, those people in their motor vehicles as they go east and west pursuing their dreams. Uh, those things include motels, restaurants, gas stations, and importantly, tourist traps. This is a decidedly post-World War II phenomena. Uh, even though there's one that I'll talk about that starts before that, 
really tourism is born of the baby boom era where a number of things happen. Two things boom. Population. Uh, uh, I think with their eyes on their own mortality, coming out of World War II, people very quickly decided that growing a family was a very good idea. Um, and the other boom was the economy. Uh, during the war, we had restrictions on our consumables, making it difficult to get things like sugar, gasoline, meat, making hamburgers, milkshakes, and travel a difficult uh, commodity to have. Uh, so what I'm going to do is look at a number of places, some that I know better than others. Uh, and uh, the ones that I don't know better than others, if there are people out there who know something about these places, I would delight in hearing from you. I'm not hard to find. I decided that I would chart this roughly traversing Nebraska from the east to the west. Uh, it's part of our mentality at that period. We think of ourselves as a westering community. Uh, and so that seemed as good as any. The earliest tourist shops are, in fact, surprisingly early. This one, Julius Myers Wigwam in Omaha, down on about 11th and Farnham in about 1874, was set up. Meyer was a really interesting guy. Uh, he was a Jewish immigrant, and he came with his two brothers, Adolf and Max. Um, one was a tobacconist, and the other was a jeweler. And Julius would take tobacco from one and beads from the other and go trade with the Omaha, the Oto, the Pawnee, the Ponca for stuff. And then he'd bring it back to his wigwam, here we see it, and um, sell it to the rubes getting off the steamboats and the railroads uh, on their way west. <coughs> the uh, The themes are all the same. And, and you can see him bragging about them. Uh, it's Indian wigwam curiosities, odd things. And he sold things like stereographic views of the Wild West and all the Indian stuff and other Western stuff. It, it was just, it was a tourist trap writ large. Okay. The first one that caught my eye many years ago was this one. This is Jerome's Teepee, just outside of Grand Island, about three miles west, as I recall, of Grand Island. And I don't know who Jerome is. He's elusive. Um, I'm sure he was somebody, because you can sure see where he's been. But he established this, uh, we call these architectural ducks. They are buildings that are built to look like something they're not. And clearly this is not a teepee. It is not made of canvas. Uh, in fact, I think, as we will see, it's probably made out of aluminum. Um, uh, brightly metallic. Uh, here's a photograph from 1950. Um, this is the kind of thing that you would encounter driving down the road. Now imagine uh, the great fun, uh, the squeals of glee as you pulled into the parking lot with... Uh, your kids at, at Jerome's, knowing that you're going to spend a lot of money for stuff that you really don't want, but that quickly become precious. Now, this is interesting. This is a Kurt Tech postcard. Kurt Tech was a major producer of postcards in the United States. That's a company, not a person. And uh, they simply did a lithograph. Uh, if we go back and look, you can see it's the same view as this Jack Bailey photograph. Um, but they turned it into a lithograph, which allowed them uh, to reproduce it in glorious color. <clears throat> well, here's some family snapshots. Uh, and you can now see the metallic glean. Um, I, I'd really like to find out if, in fact, I'm correct in my suspicion that this was a metal-clad building. Um, and here we've got another one of a guy... Uh, stepping out of the wigwam 
And I think it gives you an interesting sense of scale. I mean, look at this guy. He's not, he fills up the doorway. You don't get a lot of folks uh, crammed into that little bitty building. Um, the thing that I really like, though, is if you look at his face and you see that he's got a popsicle in his hand, he just took a big old bite of popsicles and froze his nostrils. <laughs> we all know the feeling that. Um, Jerome's talks about themselves on the backs of their postcards instructively. Uh, this teepee is uh, uh, located in the center of America, and who knows where that is. Uh, and as a symbolism of the West that when Indians roved the plains. Now I want you to think about the culture of the time. Uh, the Western in this time period ruled Hollywood and it ruled the TV airwaves. Uh, this is what you really wanted to see. The Wild West was in fact the West of the imagination. He had his own little gift shop, and that's the heart of these things, by the way. And I should have made this point earlier, I'll make it now. Uh, when I did this, I created the title first and then put together the program, and I thought, tourist traps and attractions, because that would allow me to include uh, other attractions that aren't necessarily tourist traps, like Pioneer Village or places like that. By the time I got done just with these, phenomena. I realized I couldn't talk about all of that in an hour. I'm not going to be able to get all of this in in an hour anyway. Uh, so I gave up. So you're only going to see half of it. This is a good tourist trap and it's a place where you go to buy souvenirs, Indian stuff, um, and they serve two important purposes. Oh, and toys. Let's remember, uh, one of the things, one of the services that these provided to travelers was you could buy games like Hairless Harry and all the little BB games and all the little sliding chiclet games uh, that could keep your kids entertained in the back seat for hours while you blaze down Highway 30 heading to uh, Wyoming. Uh, you could also buy the stuff that you would wear once or twice like the Indian beaded belts, uh, bolo ties, uh, or those wonderful things like arrowhead uh, uh, keychains that the minute you actually used them as a keychain, the arrowhead would break off. And uh, so they, these are all devices of, of uh, limited utility, um, but precious nonetheless. Now, here on the back, uh, this clearly in 1951, look what they say. <clears throat> Remember the picture of the boys on the Buck and Bronco? Well, this is the place. They had a Buck and Bronco. Um, it didn't move. It was very stationary. But you could climb aboard it and, as they brag, can take a picture that will fool even your friends. So get aboard old Dynamite and get your picture taken. Um, that is part of the magic of vacations, isn't it? You take these pictures and you send them to your relatives, basically with the message being, I was here, you weren't. <laughs> well, here later in life is uh, in the mid-1950s, I'm guessing, we see uh, the trading post with a substantially larger edition. Uh, the, uh, the garage off to the left side of the photograph is still there um, that he sells the junk out of. Uh, they've added to their stable of bucking broncos. You'll notice right next to the carved Indian head one and then dynamite is still to be found over on the right hand side, uh, still available for photographs. And here's one later. They really expanded it. This is Postmark 1961, um, and it's, it's interesting for what the people said. Here's the postcard. Um, well, here I am, spending money again. It was cold today. We've seen buffalo 
all sorts of things. Ponies and peacocks. That about says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> Vacation successful. And that's in 1962. Okay, let's move west to what I think is probably the earliest of our tourist traps, which is the covered wagon. Now, I've nagged people about this because this is still there, about four miles west of Kearney. And I've nagged all sorts of people that this is something that we really ought to be taking care of. Uh, uh, so far, I haven't had anybody just jump up and down and say, gee, yes, I'm going to do it. And I take that back. The current owner has, I, I spoke with him on the phone, he has some plans to uh, redevelop this as an icon of uh, highway travel. Uh, I believe he's a real estate developer and would like to move his real estate office uh, uh, out to the building that's just behind it. So there is still hope. But let's look at this place um, because it's, it's really uh, kind of astonishing. Okay, where the West begins. Do you remember that used to be Nebraska's motto before Nebraska the good life took over? Uh, Nebraska prided itself on its westerliness. And here's another, uh, again, a Kurt Tech uh, lithograph. And it says, Golden Gate or Bust. Now, this is in a time period, I think this is late 1930s. Golden Gate Bridge was completed in 1937. It was something that America had on its brain. It was one of those remarkable things, those big things we did despite the Depression. And we were full of the notion of those overland voyagers, uh, the pioneers who went in 1849 out to the gold fields of California to strike it rich. And so one of the things that they're pushing here is that uh, this is a place where you come to be part of uh, the legend of the American West writ large. Uh, they have eye-catching souvenirs. Um, I myself have never seen a longhorned Hereford, um, but that's okay. This is make-believe. Uh, and somewhere, somebody down the road made this model of the place. Uh, I don't know what it's for. I don't know why. It's clearly labeled as the uh, covered wagon carny Nebraska makes a perfectly lovely postcard. Here we see a tourist stopped. And I'm really interested. I've actually found on eBay a number of snapshots of people who stopped to be photographed with the oxen and attendant wagon, which is, of course, the purpose of it. Uh, so you notice in the far right-hand corner, there is the... Uh, uh, soda machine where you can get Hires Root Beer. Oops, pardon me, this is Nebraska. The pop machine where you can get Hires Root Beer, 7-Up, and all the other uh, necessary beverages to uh, buoy you on your way down the highway. Here's the back of it. And I want you to note the date, May 18th, 1941. Uh, a lot of these postcards are dated in this immediate pre-war era. And this isn't a postcard, by the way. This is just a snapshot. Uh, this is a postcard. If you can't read it, um, the caption on the bottom says, Taking orders from a cow hand, Kearney, Nebraska. <laughs> now, either the person who sent this card was ill-instructed or unobservant. Uh, she reports... How would you like to be this little girl and pet these buffalo? <laughs> You're not from around here, are you? <laughs> and that's 1942. The war is on by then. Now, I think this is what happened to it during the war years. Here's a couple guys. They actually, and these show up in a, in a number of views, took some animal bones and scattered them about. And I think the idea was, boom or bust, well, they busted. And so here you see a couple guys holding 
what I presume are femurs, um, uh, in front of a wagon that's beginning to show some wear. And then this one a little later where it's decidedly in disrepair. And again, I think that's because this is during World War II. Gas rationing and rubber rationing made vacations virtually impossible. So tourist attractions would not have done well at all at this time. Now, end of World War II. Here we see one from the early 1950s, as we can tell by that lovely Ford in the background. And the oxen have clearly received a refreshing coat of new paint. And uh, the three children are there posed by their moment of greatness in the American West. <laughs> and here's one taken a drive-by snapshot. Um, <clears throat> We weren't going to stop long enough to take the picture, but <laughs> hang the camera out the window and push the button. Yep, we were there. <laughs> OK, here's the important thing about the covered wagon and what they marketed. Four miles outside of Kearney, you might ask yourself why. Well, this was the location of the 1733 ranch. And the 1733 ranch, from its earliest days, uh, uh, announced itself as being halfway between Boston and San Francisco, 1,733 miles both ways. And so you were literally coming to the halfway point in your cross-continental journey. Now, I often thought that this would be really depressing if you'd been on the road for a number of days <laughs> from Boston and got here and were graphically reminded that you've got that much more to go. Here's a, a little better fixed up with a larger shop attached to it and gas pumps. And it is located five miles west of Kearney. I mismeasured. On Highway 30, this stop includes, and look at all the things they're offering now, gas, cafe, post office, pony rides, live buffalo, located midway between Boston and San Francisco, <laughs> operated year-round. Here's another view of it. Uh, here, for some reason, the uh, ox with head bowed has received a horn redo. Notice here they kind of curve up. Here they're kind of out straight. Uh, I'm sure there was some calamity that required the, <laughs> the mending. Uh, and so here we see, again, families stopped and posed with the oxen. This one we can date very nicely thanks to Mother Kodak, July of 1963. And by that point they've also added this concrete bison with a buggy in tow and a figure of some sort <laughs> lodged in the seat of the buggy. But it's still important enough to require that you be photographed with it. Okay. Let's move on to North Platte. And here's a place where the story gets complicated because it's, uh, there isn't a straight line. There's a lovely meander to all of this. Uh, we'll start with Honest John. Um, Honest John, I'm given to believe, was on the east side of town on Highway 30. And notice that we're looking at Highway 30 as the phenomena here. Uh, this, is, this is the place that you travel going from east to west. Uh, Highway 2 is a beautiful run through the sand hills. Highway 20 up through the northern end of the state. You don't see these along those routes. Um, Honest John got his name honestly. It was John. <laughs> W.E. John. And he claimed to be honest because he never made any money, therefore he must be honest. <laughs> Uh, after World War II, he ran a little plastic manufacturing operation prior to World War II and got uh, called up for service. Don't know whether it was drafted or volunteered, but uh, 
in his manual dexterity test, he failed. And so they put him to some other use in military service. He always thought that odd because he makes all these small things and no telling with the military. But at any rate, um, he marries a, uh, uh, a woman uh, by the name of Beulah hmm, Joyner from Broken Bow. And he and Beulah moved to North Platte and opened this first a, a, a plastic manufacturing operation and a gift shop. And remember, this is where plastics are really coming into their own. Uh, everything is made out of plastic starting in the early 1950s. And then he gets on the, the Wild West uh, wagon, if I may abuse a metaphor. Okay, this is Beulah with the counter cat, Eddie. Um, and you can see the stuff they're selling, but there's an important note. Apparently at one point, one of the customers liked Eddie so much he offered to buy him. Um, the Johns refused the offer, but after that, the person who made the offer sent Eddie a Christmas card. And that became a tradition, so that in 1957, Eddie got 37 Christmas cards from travelers across the United States. <clears throat> That's more than I get. <laughs> And this is Honest John. Um, he would regularly uh, assume the costume of a pseudo-Indian. Uh, he referred to the lady mannequin as his mother and said, ain't she a peach? Um, he apparently had quite the spiel that you didn't go in just for the purchase. You went in for the entertainment. Uh, this is him outside his store uh, with a saddle labeled Buffalo Bill's Saddle. And in the newspaper article about this, he announced that he just sold Buffalo Bill's Saddle and was sure looking for somebody else so we could to somebody else we could buy a new one. You wonder how many Buffalo Bill's Saddles he sold in the years. There's at Honest John's. <laughs> and here we're looking in his kitchen. Um, you will see in the, uh, on the table, uh, to the right is a garish plastic clock lamp. Um, we used to think those were attractive. Uh, a little wagon that I'll explain in a minute. A rubber-tipped spear. Um, and all sorts of other little tchotchkes, you know, the, the cool stuff that you want from places like this. And here he is in his workshop at work with a, a dental drill, the early version of a Dremel. Um, and he would manufacture all this stuff. Here's one of his items. Um, I don't know what you do with a little lamp that glows with roses inside, but <laughs> it seems precious enough. And there you see his stamp. W.E. John Plastics, North Platte, Nebraska. Um, I'm probably creating a new niche collector's market with all of this, aren't I? He also made these things. These little wooden um, models, if you will. Uh, and he had about a dozen of them, and he just made them. They were something you could put together in no time. And they were simple enough that you just plain could not screw them up. <laughs> so they were a very successful uh, uh, item to sell to kids. And they become, of course, collectibles. You have to have the whole set on your shelf over the years. Uh, so here we see uh, uh, the label for his log cabin. And note, he's selling these in 1974. I don't know when he went out of business. I don't know when this stopped. Uh, so that's, that's a work in progress. Uh, but he sold a lot of this stuff. And here is a shelf full of Honest John's completed models with a photograph of Honest John in his uh, uh, Indian uh, costume, if you will. 
Uh, he, by the way, did not have a drop of Indian blood in him. Uh, but that, like everything else, doesn't stop a good showman. And that's one of the things. Um, tourist traps are entertainment centers. We don't go to them just to buy something and leave. You go there to spend some time. And so they all have those odd things attached to them that make you want to stay there, get you to go through the merchandise aisles as often as they can, um, and uh, get you to buy stuff. This is where our story gets really complicated because it's a family story. This is the Sioux Trading Post in uh, Oglala. Um, Tom and I were talking about this and I think we finally decided this stood on the east side of town, um, but not so as you'd know it. I don't have a clue physically where this building was. It had a, a very uh, uh, odd origin. A man by the name of Royce Henline and, or George Henline and his wife Martha ran a grocery store in Atlanta and um, they also ran the post office and a few other things. Uh, their son, Royce, moves to North Platte and when I say grocery store, I mean really a general store. They sold all sorts of stuff. Son Royce moves to North Platte and opens Henline Gift Shop. And there was just a traditional gift operation. Uh, he doesn't do particularly well with that gift operation. Uh, so he um, he's it's suggested that he open a uh, a souvenir store on the highway and he bumps into a guy by the name of Doc Dunlap real name Edwin but everybody called him Doc and Dunlap was a traveling salesman who promoted postcards and horse lamps and the two of them decided what they really should do is open a souvenir stand right out in the heart of the western world of Nebraska so they put up the Sioux Trading Post. And the Sioux Trading Post becomes incredibly popular. And you can kind of see why. I'd stop there. I'd stop there in a heartbeat. Um, but they had one other thing that attracted people, and they used it to the hilt. They worked with the White Calf family out of Pine Ridge. These are all uh, Oglala Lakota people. They're all Sioux. And in the summertime, the white calves would come down uh, and do uh, dances and other fun stuff for the tourists. Um, I'm told that there are still white calves living in Pine Ridge, and I have not got up to talk to them. I'm dying to do so uh, because I think this was an incredible thing and the perfect extension of what Buffalo Bill did with his Wild West shows. He brought the real McCoy. He brought the Indians. And I'm told that the white calves were quite the good dancers. They, they really, this wasn't uh, schlock, that if you went and saw their stuff, you were seeing, seeing the good stuff. And so here's a card from 1955. Now again, think about what you're seeing on television and uh, on the movie screen, and actually probably at this point still hearing on the radio. Now they had a little problem with the white calves because initially they'd set them up and have their demonstrations out in front of the store. But what they discovered was that when you set them up and had them in front of the store, people would come for the demonstrations, and when it was done they'd get up and leave. Um, a little hiccup in the marketing strategy here. So they moved them out back in, in a stockade. So you had to go through the store to get to see the Indian stuff and you had to go through the store on your way back out. That worked much better. Uh, sales improved dramatically. 
But here, uh, I, again, here's what the card says. It's stamped July 1964. All that means is that somebody had a stamp that said 1964 on it. I don't know if that has anything to do with the time. It, it's probably pretty close. Um, the important thing is that the last line where it says, this is one of the few places on US 30 where you will see real Indians. That's quite an attraction and it becomes an issue later. So here are the white caps back in the stockade. Um, and this lady writes, um, we attended Indian shows. Kathy and other children got on stage and danced with the Indian children. Drove 753 miles today. Um, now that's compacting a large story. But you can kind of see what, what, what fun is going on here, but something really important, and we see this in all the tourist traps. There are a place where you get out of the car and you let the kids burn off some steam. Mm -hmm. There are things for them to do that allow them to decompress from those 753 miles. <laughs> that was a long day. Okay, Ogallala continues the tradition, of course, with Front Street. This is back when Front Street was a little more rustic than it is today, but the idea is still there. And the notion of marketing the Wild West is certainly alive and kicking in Ogallala. And here, um, I just want to point out the chieftain, the Indian head on the chieftain motel, um, or tourist village as it is called here. Um, that becomes iconic of these places. This is, this is something you look for as a tourist. <clears throat> okay, on the other side of town, um, after being very successful in uh, Oglala, Henline and Dunlap opened the Buffalo Bill souvenir shop. And this is on ground that actually Cody once owned. And they brag about that. And so you see here um, all of the fixings of a good Wild West site. Um, you got Buffalo Bill, you've got a bad guy hanging from the tree. Um, uh, an Indian to wave yawn in the roadside. Um, now I wanted to show you the back of this card, less for what it says, although it says a couple things, and more for another purpose. This is why you never, ever, ever want to put in, want to put anything you care about in your magnetic albums. This is what they do to your, your pictures. So um, if your takeaway today is go rip those things out of those blasted, artifact death traps called magnetic pages, um, that would be a good thing. But I want you to note here that Dunlap and Henline are distributors for these postcards and they're doing it for everybody. Dunlap and Henline become a big marketer of the tourist trade postcards. And over and over and over again, you'll see their imprint on these things. That's just another thing for collectors to think about. Okay, here's a snapshot of the trading post in the guessing early 1950s. And a little detail of that beautifully painted sign. I would love to know where that went. Uh, cool inside. That's important for summertime travel. And here's a late 1950s, maybe as late as 1960. Uh, sign. Um, I'm told that uh, at about this time uh, Dunlap and Henline sold this to one of Buffalo Bill's ancestors um, and it just didn't do very well. I don't think it ever did very well. Everybody figured that when we opened Scouts Rest Ranch uh, as a Game and Park site which was right around this time that people would flock there. Well they built it and they didn't come. We need to shift to Atlanta. 
for a moment, we'll come back to North Platte, because Henline's parents, along with his uh, uh, twin sister Joyce and her husband Jim Gladden, opened the Atlanta Wigwam. Now, we won't go down the technicality road of wigwams because this ain't a wigwam. You can look it up in Wikipedia. Um, this is clearly a fake teepee. But you get the idea. And they had, again, been in that grocery and gift business. And so it was a logical extension. Uh, Atlanta had two things that they found attractive. One, uh, they were from there. Uh, George's parents had homesteaded around Atlanta. Uh, it was on the sort of the confluence of Highway 34 and Highway 6 on your way to Colorado, so it was a well-traveled route. But most importantly, the town was dry. Atlanta was a teetotaling community. Uh, the Henlines were teetotalers, and so it was a perfectly reasonable place for them park themselves and, and open their enterprise. Like the other ones, uh, it grows over time. Uh, Western and unusual gifts for the whole family. What more could you ask for? And here they have actually built on an addition with a compound again. I don't know what they had going on out there. Um, now, the, now you know the rest of the story part. Is the building is still there standing in Atlanta. Ironically, I think it's now a bar. <laughs> the headlines probably would not approve. <clears throat> okay, let's go back to North Platte. Henline and Dunlap sell Buffalo Bill's shop and open Fort Cody. And as you can see, it's quite a deal. Now, this is the one on Highway 30. And uh, so it's quite scaled up. And it's very Hollywood in its presentation. Here's another view in the early 1960s, uh, uh, Fort Cody. This is at exactly the same time the interstate is coming along. And when the interstate comes along, it changes the nature of travel along the highways. And so they moved their operation from Highway 30. Whoops, I was just going to point out, yeah, this is on Rodeo Road, Highway 30. They move it out to a site on the interstate. <coughs> they bought the land at a time that it was functionally worthless. Nobody thought that the land was really going to be worth anything. And so they got this huge piece of real estate and built this rather huge operation on it. And it's an operation that's run to this day by the son of Royce Henline, Chuck Henline. And I went out and visited him uh, not long ago, had a wonderful time, and I want to show you a little bit about this remarkable place that you can go to today. Now, for the record, I don't own stock in Fort Cody. I'm getting no funds from Fort Cody. I don't even get a discount from Fort Cody. One of the things they sold back in the, actually back in the 50s and 60s, were these things. These are Thunderbirds that are manufactured by uh, folks from the Santo Domingo Pueblo in Colorado and the Wheelwright Museum just a year ago had a major exhibition about these things. The, uh, the folks in the Pueblo um, began building these things out of scrap plastic. They'd get old batteries, car batteries, and broken records, and broken Bakelite plastic, and they'd cut them up and turn them into these amazing, uh, uh, amazing pieces of jewelry. Uh, these are some that are in Chuck Henline's uh, personal collection, <coughs> and uh, he said, we used to sell this all the time. This was just a really hot property. Uh, now, 
uh, since the show, the collector's market has really exploded on these things. But this is where that travel trash turns into art pretty quickly. They, of course, have the two-headed calf. There would be no way that you could have a, uh, a real tourist trap without a two-headed calf. But more importantly, oh, here, his, uh, Chuck actually made this, and it's a model of the Sioux Trading Post in Oglala um, uh, that's actually animated. You put a quarter in the slot in the lower left hand, and it flies into action. Uh, but around back, you can see the Indian village. It's, it's really quite the thing. But here is the biggie. Uh, they've got there, and I had to do this on a number of photographs, this uh, wonderful model of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Done over 12 years by a guy by the name of Palmquist, who was a, a big band leader, um, who was also quite the whittler, quite the carver. And as the big band era began to wind down, he made a circus that he put in, a, a little model circus like this, not little, but that he'd throw in a, a trailer and drive around the United States showing off at fairs and other other things like that. Well, other people caught on to the idea of doing those little models of fairs and circuses and things, and so he came up with the idea of doing Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And to say that the guy lost control is an understatement. <laughs> he says 20,000 pieces. I don't know if he counted or not. I believe him. Look at this thing. And it wraps around the entire room. Now this photograph will overlap with the next one a bit. So you see the two windows together. So that's the same tent as you saw before, but here's the background. And we come around following the train. There's the Indian encampment. And then again around the wall. Now this is a remarkable piece of American folk art. It really is. Um, <coughs> Uh, all kidding aside, it's worth going to see this thing. Uh, it's, it's just remarkable. Uh, I believe it was 1967, Palmquist brought the object to North Platte because he was tired of traveling with it. And, and this was for the Centennial. And I think left it at, at Scout's Rest Ranch where it sat in a garage or a barn for a long time. Got kind of beat up. Later, um, uh, Headline, for very good reason, uh, offered to take it and put it at Fort Cody. Now, the reason for that was that um, his one attraction, the White Calf family, went from being a big asset to a big liability because in the early 1970s, he started getting complaints from customers about his exploiting the Indians. Um, that was the time. I think it's too bad because I think the White Calves probably did pretty well and these folks were show people. Like the Indians that traveled with Buffalo Bill, these are professional entertainers and it's what they do. But there's not much to be done when, as you can imagine, in the 1970s, Sentiments are running high, so uh, Fort Cody loses the White Calf family as a draw and instead moves in the Buffalo Bill diorama. And it really is immense. They also have some really wonderful artifacts there. Uh, this is one of the dresses that Mrs. White Calf would wear in her performances, and it's, it's really quite nice. And he has some of the best cowboy objects in the state, no kidding. Really impressive stuff. So, you can go there and you can buy all the junk. They still sell hairless Harry there. 
Um, they have a really good uh, book uh, selection of Wild West or of Western books, and uh, uh, all the Western gift stuff you could ever dream of. Um, uh, so it's the last one, alive and kicking, in Nebraska. A couple interesting things about the change in business. Uh, Chuck Henlein told me that the demographic of the people that stop there now have really gotten different. One, he says, uh, now you have families where both husband and wife are working, so getting a two-week vacation peeled out at the same time is a real effort. And he said what that means is that people have gone to, if you're going to go to Yellowstone, you hop on an airplane and you fly to Cheyenne and you rent a car there and drive to Yellowstone so you don't spend all that time on the road. The time becomes precious. And so he says the majority of his <coughs> market now is people driving from Des Moines and Omaha to, Sh to Denver and Cheyenne. Very different demographic. The family vacation in the car is gone. <coughs> he also noted that the worst thing that ever happened to his business is uh, the state building rest areas along the interstate. <laughs> I think that's a self-evident statement and uh, requires little explanation. The last thing, and I found this really interesting, <coughs> he said the best two years in their existence followed 9-11. Because for two years, nobody flew. Mm -hmm. All the family vacations got back in the cars, and off they went. Uh, so um, we're looking at something that not only talks about a business, and I'm kind of interested in it from the business point of view, but it talks also about the dynamic of the American family and the change that uh, we've seen uh, emerge from the post-war era, the baby boomers, uh, the places that sell the, uh, the wondrous materials that I'm sure all of us still have in our drawers hidden away in some dusty corner. Um, uh, and like I said, there's still a few of them today. Oh, one other, other thing I was going to mention, uh, and I forgot this, but it's so cool. Um, George Henlein, or Royce Henlein, Chuck's father, and Doc Dunlap really liked to fish. And so they went and opened a Seminole trading post on the uh, 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 oh I can't think of the name of the highway now it slept out of my brain Southern Florida that runs through the Everglades, which is where all the tourist traps in Florida were. Is it highway 90? Pardon me, yeah, it'd be Highway 90, but it's the. Uh, uh, Timmy Mimi Highway, I believe that's right. It's Tampa, Miami combined. Um, and they ran that for a few years, but got tired of it because they'd have to go down there in the wintertime. That was the hot tourist season down there. And so their kids were always having two school dislocations a year. Um, so they finally sold it to the Seminole tribe who ran it for quite a long time. Uh, one of the other things that really... Uh, propelled Fort Cody and, uh, well, actually the Buffalo Bill Post when they ran it, is early on they got a distributorship for uh, uh, Minnetonka moccasins. And Minnetonka was established in 1946, and uh, 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 it, it rose with the uh, gift shop tourist. Uh, and now... Uh, those Minnetonka moccasins are fashion items. Uh, I'm guessing that there's a lot of people uh, watching me talk today who have had or worn Minnetonkas. Oh, let's uh, quickly go through the back. Uh, in the back is a stockade, reminiscent of the old place, uh, with just enough stuff to be curious. And I think if you look at this, it's strategically organized to provide a stampeding place for kids. <laughs> Just enough things to look at. They've got stocks that you can put your heads through in a jail and a log cabin. And then this. Um, this is a muffler man. They were a big promotion 
on the highways. Uh, the story goes that Chuck's father was sitting having coffee one day with the guy who ran the uh, garage who said uh, that he didn't know what the heck he was going to do with this muffler man. And uh, his father told him, I'll give you 100 bucks if you deliver it to my parking lot. Well, bright and early the next morning, there it was. <laughs> and so they originally put it up and advertised it as a sculpture of Chief Crazy Horse. Uh, that didn't go so well with certain of the Lakota people, so they quit that. Um, and then they had him holding arrows and a bow or something like that. Well, that didn't play too well either. So they took it out. So now it's just this big, tall, um, motor Indian guy with nothing in his hands out back, but people sure do like it. <laughs> well, that's the story. Uh, tourist traps indeed. What wonderful places to go. I thank you all for your kind attention. And if we are clear of video, I can answer questions, should you have any. Where's the uh, North Platte operation about the only one that's left now? It's the only one I know of. <clears throat> and again, oh, I, I take that back. There is a sort of operation in Kearney called the Stagecoach. <coughs> which happens to be run. It's not on a highway, it's just a gift shop. So it's kind of associated with that, but it's run by uh, uh, the, son, the daughter and son-in-law of uh, Royce's mother. So they're cousins. Uh, but it carries American Indian art and costumes and all sorts of stuff like that. So it's kind of like that, but not really a... Uh, something designed to yank you off, off the highway. Is Card Hinge still in operation? Were they going to sell that? Or? Well, I, the last I heard is that there was negotiations. Um, uh, Car Hinge is kind of a different critter because I think it would like to become more like a tourist trap because the problem is they haven't been able to build a big enough gift shop to be able to sell gift items that keep it afloat. Um, uh, uh, I hope they find a way because I love Car Hedge. Again, that's, that's a, a, a wonderful place. Where else are you going to go to see something like that? <laughs> Ma'am. Did it not develop on those other highways, number two and so forth, because there wasn't enough traffic? Is that what you were implying? Yes. Uh, that's my best guess. Uh, I, I just... The, the, I, I think really that east-west traffic really funneled into um, Highway 30. And then down, you know, that Atlanta stretch was kind of an accident along there. But uh, really it's that east-west route that people took. You know, I, I, I don't know that many uh, tourists who are blazing their trail to Rapid City. No, um, at least in theory. The, the divide I was making was a facility where clearly there are attractions, where their avowed purpose is to sell merchandise. And so the stuff you have in a tourist trap is to attract people to come in and buy merchandise. Now, I'll tell you, the difference between a tourist trap and a museum store is the name. <laughs> um, uh, everybody wants people to come in and, and spend money. But uh, Pioneer Village was established by Harold Warp to display his incredibly large collection of stuff. And so he built that, and then they added a gift shop to it. Um, the arch was created, that gets into its own little discussion. Let's just say it was created with the uh, avowed purpose of being a cultural interpretive center, uh, not some place designed to drag people off the highway to buy stuff. Well, again, thank you all for coming. <laughs>